Hey everybody, John Grimsmo here, and welcome to Saga Saturday. Today, we're going to do some interesting projects. Today and tomorrow, actually. Um, so our Saga pens have always had a smooth tube, and I've always, always, always wondered what it would be like with a pattern on it. Um, there's a lot of technical challenges to making the pattern on the tube, namely how to hold the part between centers or make adapters and grip them or all kinds of stuff. We, we never end up taking it that far. So today we're gonna to take it that far. I'm gonna use our Willeman machine and I'm gonna to try to hold it between centers with the vise in the up position and see what I can do. I don't know. Um, I was able to 3D print some samples. So my daughter was playing with a resin printer over the weekend and so we resin printed this honeycomb uh, tube with threads and everything but it, the threads didn't work and then I also uh, filament printed this one on my Voron and the threads broke off on one side and didn't work on the other side but you can actually see them through the outside of the print but conceptually it kind of tells you tells me you know if I like it what it feels like what it's cool it's it's a sweet um, quick and dirty like like proof of concept that's what 3d printing is is best at it's like well just print it and see so that's really cool um, I want to get to the point by the end of this video where I take a standard solid tube, I'm able to hold it between centers, and at the very least, poke some dots on it around the outside and see what she looks like. Um, I won't be able to get into like five different patterns or anything, but that's the long-term goal. For this video, between today and tomorrow, uh, I've got about 15 minutes today, so tomorrow morning will be the rest of it. Uh, let's get some stuff done. Also, you may notice my new D DJI mic. So I got this kit which has two mics and the receiver, which is mounted on top of the camera right now. Um, so far, extraordinarily impressed with this kit. And yes, I have the little dangly hanging from. I don't really care, live with it. Um, we'll see what the audio sounds like. I mean, it's still a loud shop. The noise canceling that we do in the software doesn't really do anything. It just makes me sound like I'm underwater. So anyway, the convenience of using this is gonna be amazing. So. What I want to show you guys right now is the program I have going and paused. Uh, okay, running, running. So I'm making soft jaws, and I'm actually able to use, I flip the soft jaws over, and I'm using the other side of the soft jaws. So now I have a soft jaw that, that can make two programs, which is super cool. Um, so I've got my feed rate down to zero. I'm just going to slowly crank this up and show you guys what I got going on. because. I got a super long aluminum end mill sticking out of there. This is 100%. Actually, that's more like 100%. There we go. This is ripping at 10,000 RPM, going about 89 inches per minute. I also have a new camera coming in the mail that might actually focus better than this thing. This is where it gets tight. Oh, the machine's actually struggling to keep up. It's gonna shake itself to death. That's interesting. I'm gonna slow it down. See, I'm doing these tiny, tiny, tiny little circular moves. And I've got the cooling off and there's no chip evacuation. That's not a good situation. Um, Maybe if I just go super slow and just let it do what it's gonna do. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna clean that up and finish this properly. All right, let's check out these soft jaws. Not bad, not bad. So I have two little shims in the bottom there that keep a 75 thou gap between the two parts which still allows a little bit of compression. Once those shims are gone, it can over travel a little bit more than that. So I bored a 0.625 hole and I just have a rod of 625 titanium here. Let's test fit. Oh, oh, that's good. Oh, it goes in nice. So even this five, six inch long piece has the tiniest bit of wiggle at the top, which tells me it's a really good fit actually. Very nice. Um, so with those shims gone, it should be able to squish this. But I don't want to squish this. I want to squish a bearing. So the goal is to slap that bearing down in there, close the vise, 
and then machine a little um, live center that will press into this and then another live center that presses into there and then put my tube in between, bring the vise up and, and put it in place. That's kind of my, my intention. We'll see what it works. Now these bearings are meant to be radial bearings. So they're meant to have a load, you know, in this direction, not so much in this direction. Um, but I'm really not putting a lot of load on this part. And this is, this is the quickest proof of concept I could think of to hold a pen tube uh, between centers. We could absolutely do it on our Nakamura, but that machine's pretty busy and the live tools on it kind of suck. Live tools on this machine are incredible and I have so many of them. And I have a whole tool carousel with lots and lots of tools. So I've got ball end mills, flat end mills, turning tools, chamfer tools. So I can do some pretty crazy stuff to a Saga tube in this setup if it works out. What's really cool about these mics is I don't have to be right next to the camera. I can set the camera down and have it far away. So I'm going to open it up, check my cheat sheet, open jaw, M189. Cancel, MDI, M189, and the block insert. So I can hold onto the shims, open the vise, blow them off. And I've said it before and I will continue to say it again, oil machines kind of suck. This runs oil, not the white coolant like our other machines do. And uh, man, it is just messy. Imagine having cooking oil on your fingers every time you touch a part. But you get used to it, it's fine. And then I go to touch my camera and my camera gets all oily. Anyway. Okay, so here I have my dual purpose vice jaws. See that tiny little hole in the bottom? If I flip the jaws over, then I can use that tiny hole to make these screws that we made in previous videos. But in this orientation, we can put our bearing in there. So it should fit with plenty of clearance because the jaws are open now. Notice that the opening is, it doesn't open very far. So whatever distance from bearing to end there, that's how far the jaw opens. And then it closes on top of that. So M188 will allow me to clamp on this bearing. It is seated, good to go. Let's see, there you go. So that bearing should be in there really nice. Now I just have to machine a little plug that goes in there and has a live center. So that when the vise, uh, when the vise comes up, I can have a live center this way, and then I just machine a little taper there. Um, because the U-axis stroke is not very much, and when the vise is up, I only have a two inch uh, movement range, and I, I gotta cheat it to make this fit. You'll see later. Okay, let's bring the jaw up, and I'm gonna show you guys how this works. Sick. Okay, so, so we go jog, U-axis, and now my jog handle is able to move the U-axis in and out. This is as far as it goes that way, and it only goes in two inches that way. And imagine, this is my tube. There's not a lot of room here to fit this in. So if, say I took this bar and I turned the taper onto it. Okay, so that goes there, but now I can't support the backside unless I build some crazy contraption out the backside. But what I'm going to do is instead of using this extended nose collet, I'm going to go to my little stash of collets over here and I'm going to use this flush. Notice extended nose sticking out so far, flush one inch collet, and then I'll just use some like one inch material to have a very flush uh, taper on the end of that somehow. That's tomorrow's challenge. But then that flush collet doesn't stick out very much past that surface. So I'll be able to go against the bearing and against that collet and hold my part like this. So the sub side, this side, is gonna rotate freely in the live center and this side is gonna be pressed with a little bit of pressure against the rotating um, uh, 
angularly adjustable C axis or A axis, and they call it in this machine. So I'll be able to like mill a set of dots on the top, rotate it, mill a set of dots, or do contour milling or something. Um, but it won't be held very rigidly. That, that U axis is hydraulic when it comes up and it's, it's not impossible to overcome the pressure and have it fall down. Um, so I'll figure that out. Back at it for day two. I have to clearance the fixture a little bit. Add another little feature for myself. And I just think machining aluminum looks really cool. I slowed down the feed rate of this adaptive toolpath because it was uh, struggling to keep up with the little tight moves before. Man, machining aluminum is like cheating. We do so much titanium and stainless, almost everything we do. So here in Fusion, we have my, this is the ball bearing. Remember, it's a very small bearing, but everything looks bigger in CAD. So if I hide the bearing again, this is my, um, I'm gonna revolve this around. So this is your center line, and this is just half. This is typically how I like to design lathe parts. Not always, but mostly. Almost always, pretty much always. So this, I'm gonna do uh, 1248 as a radius, so just under a quarter inch should slip into the bearing. I have a little um, groove here where the tool, the cutting tool will be able to come in and clearance that out because remember the bearing goes all the way. So if this chamfer or this radius is up here, then it won't slip all the way and be flush with the bearing. Um, and then little radii on top and then a 60 degree taper, which we planned this before. So like five years ago when we first designed the Saga, we purposely designed a 60 degree taper chamfer on both sides of the threads. So every saga we've ever made has that chamfer on it exactly for this reason. So that we can put it between centers and actually, you know, turn a feature on it. So uh, all that planning is finally coming to fruition. <laughs> all right, let's revolve this feature real quick. Revolve that and that around axis of this. Boom. Look at that. Okay, I remember I got to put a radius on the front. I can't put a radius on the back, at least not super easily, because the turning tool is going to come in and it can't, uh, it can't make that radius, at, not easily, I don't really care for this part. Um, that's fine, but I will put a radius on the front. So in Fusion, now what I've done, I have my part modeled over here where it's going to actually live. I copied the component and I'm going to drag it over, I'm going to paste it, so I'm going to hide my tube because I'm not making that. I have a copy of the part and the collet that I'm actually going to be using. I need a bit of clearance here to be able to chop it off. So I put it kind of wherever I want. That should be good. And then I can make it. So now this is my manufacturing model. This is my design model. So here in Fusion, we have our little part and I have a couple of operations. I have a part off to clean off the end of the stock, groove roughing, face the end with a nice end mill, rough the, uh, rough the contour a little bit, finish the contour, and then use my high feed end mill to zip, 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 zip. And then either this flap will still be there or the part will be in the chip tray, I don't really care. But one and done, don't worry about the vise, don't worry about anything, just easy, easy. It's going good so far. Super hard to film through this window. It's weird hearing lathe noises and it's not from this lathe, it's from that lathe. So the knack's running, the Swiss is running, and now the Willowman's running. But I'm hearing drill squeak. And I'm like, I'm not drilling. Alright, tool change. Now's our high feed. I'm gonna, yeah, I'll send it, whatever. Oh, look at that thing go. I freaking love high feed end mills. That's it. Tool breakage. Goes between the laser, sees if it's broken. 
goes home, goes home, does all its dance, waits for five seconds, and then it alarms out and says, hey, I can't make the next part. Look at that, it actually, it held. Boing. I could have gone a little bit thinner, but yes. Yes, that is good. Um, it looks like I didn't pull my stock out far enough. The end of the part is not as perfect as I wanted it to be, but I'll fix that on the next one. It's the beauty of lathes. If one doesn't work out, you just make another one. It's kind of like 3D printing. You know, if the print doesn't work, you just print another one. So even after I dialed in this turning insert, the part still came out uh, far too oversized. One thou, one and a half tenths. And that is unacceptable. Um, it won't even fit in the bearing, like not even close. And I think what's happening is I'm chipping the insert. So let's pull the insert out and, uh, and we'll look at it on the microscope. These inserts are what we use on we use these on the Swiss, that one, um, like every single day. We get thousands of parts out of an insert. And I am consistently blowing the tip of that insert literally on the first part every time I run A2. And it's driving me crazy. Um, typically we cut titanium and 17-4 stainless steel. So maybe this grade of carbide, this coating, this whatever is just not suited for A2 for a tool steel, even though it's soft A2, it's not hard at all. Um, literally every time it chips it in like the first pass, the first part that I make, and it's so frustrating. And I don't think I have another grade of insert that will fit in this holder. Um, so I gotta figure something out. I might switch the material to 17.4, which is probably better for what I need anyway. Something Pierre suggested was that since I'm babying that turning insert, maybe I need to do a heavier depth of cut so I'm not rubbing. So on this piece, I did a test cut with a 10th out depth of cut, which should bury the radius, that's what they say. And it is chipping the coating, like the coating peeled off at the tip of that. So the, the geometry is still fine, but after that one test cut, like it's not happy. Um, so I'll run it and I'll do a heavier cut on the on the final product. I'll see what it does, but I don't know. It's frustrating. Nope, same problem. Too big. I'm gonna switch material. Half inch A2 is uh, ideal size, not the ideal material, and it's gonna be too soft for what I'm doing anyway. I want something harder. Um, so I do have five eighths, 17.4 that is already heat treated to about 45 Rockwell. This is the stuff to use. I was just avoiding using the bigger diameter because I got to switch collets and then I got to make the machine longer, but whatever, I'm doing it. Changing out the collets on this machine is actually super duper easy. Um, you just lock the spindle from rotation, you open the collet, and then this unscrews, there's a tool to unscrew it, and I've got it almost all the way out right now. And then that one comes out, this one goes in, tighten it up, just go to a dead stop, and then it's done. So it really takes like a minute. So much more stock removal with this bigger material. You can see it all piling up there. There's supposed to be a cover that comes and covers all that stuff. Uh, I just haven't installed it yet. I, it didn't come with the machine. I had to buy it separately. We still have to install it. So we'll see that bigger material, we'll see if, and harder material, 17.4. We'll see if she does what I want. Well, still chipping. One part. Okay, so when you try to isolate every variable and you try to change material, you try to change depth of cut, I haven't changed speeds and feeds, maybe I should look at that. Um, usually when I get to this point, I wonder, Am I the problem? <laughs> is my brain telling me to do something that I shouldn't be doing? Is the way I've designed the tool path, the way I've done the depth of cut, the speeds of heats, things like that. But am I making assumptions that I don't know about yet that are causing this to happen, which is driving me crazy, but is a challenge. And the other thing, I was talking to Saunders about this on our podcast yesterday, two days ago. Um, He's like, dude, we don't do any turning on our Willamette. We just do milling. And I could absolutely 
probably mill all of these features if I took the time to program it. Um, so if turning is really frustrating me, there are options to mill it instead. Anyway, I will figure this out. Okay, in Fusion, looking at the cutting data, uh, I did notice a difference. I'm feeding this tool, 247 SFM is fine, but I'm feeding it a 2000 per rev, whereas normally when I run this tool on the Tornos in stainless steel, hardened stainless steel, I do this at 0009 inch per rev, so nine tenths per rev. And that is our total standard go-to recipe. Works all the time, so I'm gonna try that. that. That could be a big difference. And nope, three and a half thou oversized, which means my insert chipped again. Dude, I'm like, I'm like six inserts in. I've made four or five parts already. I can't get this. Anyway, this here is the idea, once I grind the nub off, that it will fit into the taper of the tube and press against it and hold it. I have an idea. So I told you I have a solution, right? Well, I'm gonna do what Saunders told me to do and I'm gonna mill it. Tool change to a milling tool. Watch this. Oh, I love it. So I'm just finished milling that diameter, and we shall see. Tool breakage. Such a cool machine. Now we come in and part it off. All right, moment of truth. Oh, baby. Usually a lathe part, I'll rotate it, I'll measure it again. So depending on where you hit it, it might be two tenths over, it might be one tenth under. Let's see if it fits inside of a bearing. I, I want it to be a slip fit, not a press fit. Oh, oh yes. A little bit of a lip at the bottom there, but I might be able to make this work. Super close, super close. All right, last try, perfect fit. Perfect, perfect, perfect. One part complete, and that's time. That is all I have time for today, unfortunately so. Let's call this a completion of part one. Next week, I will have more time to actually finish this, well this is done, install this, do the main side um, dead center, I guess you'd call it, and then actually mount a saga tube and actually start patterning it. We'll spend a bit more time on that. It'll be amazing. So that wraps up this video. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, it's fun making these project videos, but they, they take a bit of, of effort and I don't always have the time chunks in order to do them, but I'm, I'm having a lot of fun, fun with this. So I will see you guys next week. Thanks for watching. Bye.